our three-sector model right now. You have for-profits, short-term profit is the objective. You have non-profits uh, serving some very specific social mission. And then you've got government entities, which is ideally serving the common good, right? And then you got to ask yourself, is this three-sector model of coordination really creating the outcomes that are creating a thriving civilization, right? And if not, what's the shift? I believe that we're in the process of designing a completely new model that incorporates the best of those three sectors, but in a way that creates different incentives and distributes reward more broadly. Welcome to the Regeneration Will Be Funded. My name is Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're exploring the intersections of regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. Created with Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations and more at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Andrew Hewitt. Andrew works to change the game of our economy from win-lose to win-win. In this discussion, we talk about his extensive work in the for-purpose sector and what have been some of his key learnings and insights. We also go into a really useful model or framework that he's developed, which identifies six clear game aspects that we can improve upon to evolve from our current form of win-lose capitalism into win-win. Finally, we get into the philanthropic sector and do a deep dive around donor advised funds or DAFs. This conversation was recorded in Mangaroa, Aotearoa, New Zealand in March, 2023. Let's dive in, Andrew Hewitt. Welcome. Today we have Andrew Hewitt. Andrew has worked in the field of system change for quite some time and also serves as a board member of Pachamama Alliance. Andrew, very excited for this conversation. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Matthew. Nice. So you, you are a man who wears many hats. How, how would you sum up kind of the work you do and the journey you've been on? The journey started with the Pachamama Alliance, which was an initiative called Awakening the Dreamer, which is a recognition that, that the dream of the modern world was one that was creating a lot of social environmental injustice and really leading us to this meta crisis that we're now in. So the journey began with waking people up and what quickly followed that was a recognition that when you, when you go to then do stuff to help solve this crisis of crises, you need to coordinate in some way. And what are you left with? A for-profit, a non-profit, maybe a government organization. And those means of coordination just were insufficient to meet the problems that we're facing. Mm. And so most of my work over the last 15 years has been looking at how do you change the game from models of, of win-lose capitalism to something that creates wins for all, recognizing that these levels, this, this level of, of challenge requires regenerative funding. You know, mm -hmm. we can't rely on governments and nonprofits, which are funded by for-profits, to, to solve these complex issues. We need to create a regenerative engine mm. that lasts into the future and isn't in its very nature a generator of the problems, which you could say capitalism has been. So that has been my fascination and changing the game is, is the work. Mm. You have some some brilliant models for what that can look like and some some very specific and concrete ways of, of visualizing and describing, which I want to get into in this discussion. But before we go there, I'm I'm curious, you know, with starting with Pachamama Alliance and this kind of awakening the dreamer and awakening to the meta crisis, like how was that experience for you personally mm -hmm. and how did that land? I think a lot of people can relate to this confusion growing up in this time where you see injustice, you see just like insane behavior. Mm -hmm. And 
you feel stuck and like, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And, and part of what paralyzed me in, in knowing what to do was not understanding what was the, the, the root mm-hmm. of the crisis. Like what, I didn't want to just put a Band-Aid on it. And so how do you, in such complexity, navigate to find the causal drivers of all of this? And so my journey was first letting myself feel the pain and letting myself um, go into the, the despair uh, that we were living in one of these, these moments. Mm-hmm. And, and then also rising to the challenge and saying, I'm all in. You know, I did the entrepreneurial thing. I was that, that A-type personality trying to achieve and get more and doing all that, but participating in, in the madness, you could say. And the wake up was also a, a, an invitation to let that all go. And I recognized that what would be needed for me, at least, was to get out of that environment. So I literally booked a one-way ticket to Costa Rica and paused, Mm -hmm. uh, put myself in nature and just reflected on, you know, what's mine to do in all of this? Mm -hmm. Like, how am I uniquely designed to contribute? And what are the root causes that I feel drawn to contribute to help solve? Because I wanted to give my life fully to something that that really felt meaningful, and so um, that led me to some of this recognition that I've I've shared that mm. that uh, you need to change the game in order to change behavior. And turns out there's a lot of personal change that's required <laughs> in that journey as well. Right, right. So you, so you had this kind of awakening so to speak of the the multi multitude of crises that we face on on the planet and you you transmuted that that despair and that energy back into um into work after taking a bit of a pause and and Mm -hmm. going through a bit of a journey as as i'm understanding you and i've heard many people share something similar about um their their journeys starting with Pachamama Alliance. And so for those who aren't familiar with the organization and the work of Pachamama Alliance, I think it'd be useful just to unpack that a bit more. Sure. So Pachamama Alliance grew out of a relationship with uh, the tribes of the Amazon, um, the Achuar, the Shuar, who put out a call to the Western world and said, if you recognize that your future is tied with ours, then come work with us in changing the dream of the modern world. Come learn how we've stewarded nature for all of these years, lived in harmony with it, come learn from us, right? Mm. And, uh, and likewise, and how we can contribute our learning also to support them in their future. And that's been the alliance. And uh, so we have a bold mandate to permanently protect uh, the sacred headwaters, which is a vast and a very important region that controls our climate uh, of the Amazon. Um, but we also work in the North, work in the Western more developed world in, in helping shift um, the mindsets that contribute to this destruction. And also, uh, we have a Game Changers Intensive, you know, of how to really understand what it takes to be a game changer and participate in coordinating and being uh, in, in a different frame in terms of, of important action. And so we have a variety of programs. People can go to the Pachamama.org um, website and learn all about. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And and so game changers, like what what does that mean? How is it expressed in the work? And what are what are you learning about this journey of of going out and finding people who are who are fundamentally trying to change the game? Sure. So so while I was in Costa Rica, my with my backpack sitting in the jungle with no Wi-Fi and just uh reflecting, one of the things that came through so strongly was there was a group of people alive at this time who we're here to help change the game. I just knew it in my soul. It's just like, th- mm. that, that's what happens. And we've been through these shifts in ages before, you know, as I started studying history and I was like, is this the end of it all? Or is this just a phase shift? Or is this a little moment of turbulence? And I realized, oh, well, well we're actually in a, a, what I believe is a is a shift in epoch. We, we arguably have had five of these before where the nature of civilization goes through a, a phase shift. And that every time we've had this, there's been a relatively small group of people, visionaries, that see the world from a different perspective 
and leverage some sort of breakthrough in communication at that time, whether it was books or, or um, the radio or TV or now the internet, to coordinate and gather people around a new way of looking at things. And so I believe that's what's been happening. And I felt really drawn to find these people. Who are the game changers? And how do we support them? And so that was my quest. And uh, that led me to do a ranking of the world's top um, purpose-driven companies. It became Game Changers 500, an alternative to the Fortune 500. And it's been this ongoing journey now bringing me into Web3 to find those who are at the forefront of helping change how we coordinate as a society. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, your your path and my path have crossed in various synchronistic <laughs> ways for many years. And I've um, my experience is that the the rest of the popular zeitgeist has been gradually catching up to a lot of the key ideas and principles that you've been out documenting and exploring for for many many years whether that's around impact investment social enterprises benefit corporations mm -hmm. you know alternative ways to do business etc and so you know you you've kind of been early to to the puck on this um, I'm curious how you're experiencing that zeitgeist and kind of what what are some of the trends over these last 15 years that mm. you're noticing? Yeah. Well, we all now know the word social enterprise. Mm. That wasn't the case even just 10 years ago. Mm. And so I would say phase one of the shift in changing the game was was a mass number of people saying we don't want to be for profit or nonprofit. We want to accomplish a mission we can generate revenue doing it. We, won't, we don't want to be limited by these, these structures and funding mechanisms. And so uh, that, I think, was a first wave. And it was a wave I participated in early. Uh, I got to work with the US government and, and all sorts of people on policy um, frameworks to help actuate what we call a fourth sector, mm. which is defined as a primacy area of purpose. So the, the purpose of the enterprise is like a nonprofit. Um, yet it has an engine like a for-profit. So it's that middle space, often called social enterprise, um, B Corps. You know, there's all sorts of now names for this, conscious capitalism. Um, what a lot of people don't know, though, is that there's all, also a lot of work to really ground it in, in the legal system and create certain tax incentives for it. And it's an ongoing process, I'd say. Mm -hmm. It's in a meaningful space now. And I will say that in that journey, we learned a lot. And we learned that if you don't, take certain actions early on when you're structuring these enterprises and you're you're bringing in certain types of capital that what happens is the game mm. slides back to win-lose Sli slides slides totally. back to traditional capitalism and having ranked a lot of these best for the world companies the tragedy for me mm. was watching some of my favorite brands slide back mm -hmm. to traditional capitalism when they raised more money the founder left or got kicked out Mm -hmm. And so that then brings us into this Web3 conversation, which is mm -hmm. we can go so far with the tools and vehicles that we have and the, the, the knowing of how we coordinate now, what's next and how does that fundamentally change the game? Yeah, because it seems like, you know, we can say, hey, I'm starting a business and I'm mission driven and I'm purposeful and, you know, yeah, I'm raising money from traditional equity investment structures that have an incentive for perpetual growth and value capture back to shareholders. And, you know, and then the founders leave at some point or, you know, the, the constraints of the, the business and the marketplace um, result in needing to, yeah, like maybe we soften that mission. Maybe we kind of changed a little bit of that rhetoric. Maybe we, you know, and, and but what's actually driving, you know, the, the Charlie Munger quote, or I think it's Charlie Munger, you know, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like it's it's uh, it, the incentive structure at the, at the core of these organizations ultimately ends up being a more highly predictor of what the outcome of the work is, mm -hmm. despite all of the best intentions and flowery, you know, rhetoric along the way. And so I think a lot of people become cynical about this space um, because it's, you know, w was there really anything different or were we just making ourselves feel better, but still <laughs> perpetuating the, the, the ills of capitalism? So, you know, help me understand, you know, what you're seeing as the structural changes that can actually um, make for a transformational fourth sector. 
This is where game theory is interesting, you know, what you're saying around incentives. So uh, capitalism is a game of incentives and it drives certain types of behavior. And we know some of those outcomes of that behavior. And so when we look at uh, going into Web3 as a step beyond just kind of for benefit social enterprises, what can then further institute a, a true change in the game, mm. a true change in long-term incentive so that we get different behavior. And this is a complex area. So I like to simplify things with frameworks. And mm. so if you look at what are the six core drivers of behavior or the six common aspects of the game mm. coordination, uh, first you have the objective of the game. Is that objective short-term profit? Is that objective a specific mission or is that objective serving the common good mm -hmm. right and you could mirror those three to our three sector model right now you have for profits short term profit is the objective you have mm -hmm. nonprofits uh, serving some very specific social mission and then you've got government entities which is ideally serving the common good right mm -hmm. and then you got to ask yourself is this three sector model of coordination really creating the outcomes that, that, that are creating a thriving civilization, right? Mm -hmm. And if not, what's the shift? I believe that we're in the process of designing a completely new model that incorporates the best of those three sectors, um, but in a way that creates different incentives and distributes reward more broadly. Mm -hmm. So aspect of the game, number one, is the objective. Mm -hmm. Aspect two is choice making, how the decisions get made. Uh, aspect three is how do you develop people to play the game? Uh, aspect four is motivation, like what, what drives the behavior? Um, aspect five is performance assessment. How do you keep score? Mm. And then aspect six is benefit. How does benefit get distributed um, to those playing the game? Mm. So now if you take that lens across those six game aspects and you look at traditional capitalism as, as we're playing it today, say, well, the objective is, is short-term profit. Choice making is usually in some sort of command control um, leadership model. Right. Uh, the development of players is usually training people for specific roles and results. The motivation is driven by short-term profit, like mm. quarterly earnings. That's what's driving all the incentives, right? Mm. And bonuses. And, and how is performance measured? Well, it's a single bottom line financial, right? Mm. How's benefit distributed? It's um, concentrated actually among owners, investors, like, right. and then not distributed widely. So what we've tried to do with the four sector is go beyond that. We've tried, okay, let's take capitalism and let's make it more conscious. Mm. So what do we do with the objective? We make it around a noble mission. What do we do with choice making? We broaden that more empowering empathic models of leadership. What do we do with developing people? Well, we develop people um, to know their intrinsic gifts and to be in roles more aligned with, with their, their greatest abilities that inspire them. Uh, what do we do with motivation? Well, we shift motivation from just financial incentives and we, we start rewarding CEOs for meeting social and ecological goals. And thus, performance measurement also shifts to mm -hmm. a triple bottom line. Right. And then benefit gets distributed not just to the owners and investors, but uh, more broadly, um, usually things like fair trade, living wage, um, you see profit sharing and things like this, right? So you can say, wow, we've changed the game. We've sh in all six of these areas, we've got a new dynamic. Mm. And for people who are, are listening, these, these visuals are being put up on the screen. They're also in the show notes because there's this, this simple framework and model of what you're describing to go from win-lose capitalism to win-win uh, capitalism is, uh, I think, a very uh, simple lens that especially people in the kind of founding stages of organizations can, can consult and see that there are a lot of patterns that are persistent across these different projects and these different efforts. Yeah. And so, you know, this, this offers a bit of a compass or a guide for how to think about maybe some of these, these six different dimensions. Yeah. Mm. So now let's look at some of the champions in what I've just described, right? So you've got Tom Shoes, you've got Whole Foods, you've got Ben and Jerry's, right? Early movement makers in this mm. space. Where are they today? <laughs> right? 
all owned by classic for-profit mm-hmm. corporations, right? And if you were to interview the founders, they'd have a lot to say about that. And so we know that while there's an intention to shift these in these dynamics, something hasn't shifted enough to sustain that commitment to care in the face of new capital, in the face of scale, and all the dynamics that business goes through. So I think we, we must not lie to ourselves or cheat mm. our, our souls from what we're really capable of doing. And having worked with a lot of these founders, it, it, it really feels like a tragedy that all of that work, all of that commitment, all that gets lost back to a coordination system that's fundamentally win-lose in its design. It's a zero-sum game. It's, it's okay. That's the game. Mm-hmm. And maybe that particular game can be played and is meant to be paid by certain people at certain developmental levels, but not in a way that creates massive devastation in the world, right? It may have its role still in, in society. Right. But there's a lot of people developmentally that are all in to contribute their lives to a noble mission, and they're not wanting to just work at a nonprofit. They have the capacity to generate. Where do they? How, how, what, what game do they play? And I believe that's what we're starting to see in Web3 is the early um, introduction, just like I experienced in the early for benefit movement. It was still very scrappy back in 2009, 2010, people were trying to figure out what it was. We're, we're in that moment right now with DAOs and all the sorts of tokenization um, projects we're seeing. And so, so I'll speak lastly to the, this, this, this next phase shift in mm-hmm. terms of some of the design principles I see. Mm-hmm. So the objective is shifting to accomplish um, not just a mission, but to serve the commons. So it's it's more broad. Uh, the choice making is shifting just from em- empathic, empowered leadership to what I call synergistic sovereignty. So it's recognizing that a collective of wisdom is more wise in making choices than just a small group of individuals. And it's nurturing people's capacity to, to actually be in their sovereignty, which I'll define next, mm. um, in that process. So it's, it's increasing freedom rather than decreasing individual freedom in service of the common good. And this is the tragedy of the commons that everybody's been trying to figure out. It's like, mm. how do you increase freedom while also prioritizing the common good? And I feel these are some of the models we get to explore with, with, with Web3. So that's that's choice making. The next big one is is development. How do you develop people for this game, right? So we're moving from just in, just training people from roles uh, to helping them be thriving in their certain strengths to nurturing coherence. So in this third tier of the game, we're really looking at if you're going to make decisions as a DAO, if you're going to work more in synergistic sovereignty, if it's more of a collective um, sense making approach what are the skills to thrive at that? Mm. And it turns out there's a lot in this particular domain that we're not ready for. It's like we can design the game, but if if it's the hardware, but if we're not able to play the game, we're, the software can't run on the hardware yet because the software is so programmed by the culture we've grown up in, by hierarchy, by individualism, by selfishness, by different trauma patterns that are running all the time that we're usually not even aware of the capacity to play this type of thing that our hearts know is possible. We yearn for it. We're, there's a lot to, to do in this, this domain. So then the next one is, is, is motivation, right? So what's shifting in motivation? Well, we're going from a game design that's based in incentive, extrinsic motivation, to a game design that motivation comes from within. It's intrinsic. It's, mm. It erupts from insight. So again, going back to nurturing coherence, going back to sovereignty, if you develop one's capacity to listen, to be still, to not act from ego or the voice that's been programmed in their mind that needs to prove something or get more or do more, but they're really just an agent of wisdom itself, eventually, you're not just sitting on the beach meditating all day, you erupt into action. Something moves you into action, it's, it, but it comes from insight. And if you look at all the great leaders through, throughout time, Mandela, Gandhi, etc., Einstein, where was the source of their motivation, mm. right? Their, their motivation was source from source that erupted them into some sort of action that was meaningful. And so we need to break out of the game design of, of extrinsic incentive to truly be free as individuals. And to be truly free as individuals, we need to heal certain parts of ourselves. 
that allow that type of, of, of energy to move through us. And we need others that are stable in that development to play with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's motivation. Now, if you go into performance assessment in these games that we've been playing, it's very metric driven. It's very mental. It's very masculine. It's very outcome focused. And we know that the most complex challenges we face aren't going to be solved by right? just like a, a mental blueprint. You know, nature shows us that the greatest creations come from emergence. It's different parts coming together to form something that we couldn't possibly have imagined. That's what I believe the, the, a game that produces wins for everybody will be based in. It's, it's, it's more complex than, than control. And therefore, how we measure performance isn't based on metrics. Uh, certain projects could be used metrics, but at the broader scale, we're, we're using our discernment to assess, to assess what creates more quality of life. It's a constant sensing. Um, and then reward. How does reward change? Well, obviously, we're moving from more concentrated forms of reward, a few people becoming rich and, and distributing that more broadly. And I think that's what we're obviously seeing with distributed technology, with blockchain that we have a capacity to distribute that reward and therefore give more people the power to do all the other aspects of the game, mm -hmm. <laughs> act from their own intrinsic motivation because they have some um, true vote, some control, some ability to create as a creator that they are. Mm. Wonderful. It sounds like you have a an optimistic view of Web3 and its potential. And, you know, I think a lot of people who aren't as familiar with the space are going to be informed by lots of headlines that emphasize the speculative nature, the over-financialization, the lack of regulatory oversight or adherence, um, you know, huge meteoric rises and falls of big personalities and egos. And so, you know, anyone could be forgiven for being a bit cynical and mm -hmm. skeptical of this space. I'm curious how you're reconciling that. Are you just choosing to focus on the positives and not giving too much energy and attention to the, the shadow sides? Or are you sensing that collectively this is really in the right you know, direction and evolution and growing in the right ways? Or is it that we have a lot of work to do? And I, yeah, I'm just curious how you're sensing all of that. Well, with any advancement in technology, it just accelerates the consciousness that's using it. Mm. So I think the, the one of our existential risks is that we now have the power of gods without the love and wisdom of gods. You know, you look at AI, it's in the wrong hands. It's mm. going to unemploy a lot of people, uh, the ability to profit a very few, right? That's just like, it's madness. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, same with, I think the nature of blockchain is is based in distributing power. So fundamentally, I think it's a very meaningful technology for exactly what we need at this moment in history. And so, but will the same powers of greed come in and, and corrupt it? Yeah, it's exactly what's happening. Will capitalism try to take it over? It's exactly what's happening. And so I, I love what you're doing with these interviews, Matthew. It's so important to bring a vo voices together um, to help guide uh, really ethical and meaningful uses of this technology because it truly is a breakthrough uh it has a huge promise and it's really up it's up to us mm. and it's up to us not to be preyed on by capitalistic interests by selfish interests but to really give ourselves um to using this in the most meaningful ways and that is the reward you know mm. it's, it's it's the reward is the joy you get from contribution and so I have hope in that, that people will choose that. Mm. Nice. And I'm curious your relationship with the word capitalism and the circles that I'm a part of, I'm seeing a lot of different viewpoints of whether um, this word survives this next <laughs> transition moment that we're in and people adamantly, you know, trying to defend the merits of market-based systems and the things that capitalism does really well um, and people who are very adamant and clear that 
you know, the nature of worshiping capital is the fundamental consciousness root problem, mm. um, and that we really need to be thinking post capitalism, beyond capitalism, and going into a different a different space. And so, I'm sensing a lot of different perspectives in this mm. in this topic, and I'm curious how how you're landing. The minute we we polarize, right, wrong, good, bad, mm. we're we're divided and mm. we're confused and we're not seeing the whole, right? And so it's, I don't think it's ever that simple. Uh, if you look at people using the basics of capitalism, selling goods and services, earning a re reasonable income, it, it's it's a fine model. On a local basis, it's a fine model of mm. being able to buy and sell at scale with technology accelerating it, massive corporations extracting that's where it starts to be becoming an existential risk. It's like the win-lose game starts to become lose-lose for everybody because it debases the very playing field where we're, we're the, the biosphere. And so that's the concern, right? Mm. And, and so what I'm proposing is that we go from a three-sector system, for-profit, non-profit government, to a, a revamped multi-sector system. I think DAOs, as a, it's a very broad term, but they, in a way, it replaces some sort of role that like governments have played, where you have uh, an entity that's responsible for ensuring a common good. What I sense will happen is that we'll organize around areas of impact. And so right now we have these gigantic economies based in countries. And the level of trust you can have among all the participants in that country is very low because there's so many people and hence all the corruption and the mistrust in governments. And that's a whole conversation where I think what we're going to see is people grouping into areas they're drawn to uh, in terms of impact they want to support. And that there's, there's DAOs that are governing those areas of impact. They participate in because they're part of that little micro economy. And within that, there's projects, there's revenue generating projects that operate probably not so dissimilarly to uh, a for benefit organization that's driven by a mission. Within that also, there might be more profit oriented initiatives that deliver meaningful products and services that need to be delivered. But how the distribution of the reward works, how choices are made, how needs are met of the people all participating in that is fundamentally different than how we're doing in our current three sector system. I feel that's the change we're arriving at and we're ready for and we're designing. Mm. And how, given that you have experience working from a, a informing policymaking in the United States and kind of trying to work on uh, expanding the area for these new fourth sector types of, of uh, initiatives and giving legal recognition and incentives for this type of work. Um, many in crypto and Web3 are maybe a bit adversarial to nation state at this stage because the regulatory environment's been very unclear and very combative. And it's like, okay, well, we just have to go build a better alternative system and kind of ignore that side of things. Some people are heavily invested in lobbying for, for rule change. Um, you know, these kind of top-down, bottoms-up considerations. I, I'm curious kind of how much do you feel like the regulatory legislative aspects are going to, are they going to trail the work that's mm. being pioneered here? Is, is it going to help enable? Like, and how do you think about the effectiveness of where to place energy? Yeah. Well, I think it's old saying, it's like, the Buck, Bucky Fuller quote is, is if you want to change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. And then, you know, at first, this level of change is ridiculed, right? Always rejected, said to be crazy. <laughs> and then eventually it becomes the, the new way, right? And so I think we just need to expect all of that. And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, to actually build a working model is I think what the legislators need to see. You know, a lot of my work in the four benefit space was I was uh, researching and evaluating thousands of companies and redefining them as four benefit entities. So they already existed in whatever form they existed, but based on our, our definitions, we're saying, well, if we actually had 
for benefit legislation, this company, this company, this nonprofit, they'd actually be redefined as for benefit. Now, look, policymakers, how big um, of, a, of a sector of the economy this is. And imagine if these organizations had the proper legal structures, they would be thriving even further. And, and we have all the testimonials from those organizations, different for nonprofits and for profits, to say how how much of an advantage it would be if we made some of these legislation changes. So I think legislators often do, you know, have the best of interests in serving the whole. And they need to see data, they need to see proof before they're gonna pull a big lever of change. And mm. so um, we're in the part of the process of 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 really proving it, proving yeah. that we have something that will work and is is meaningful for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So here we are in 2023. What do you see as the, the key challenges in, in terms of proving it that the ecosystem faces? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the core challenges we face, I think, are projects that start to get traction, get interest from certain types of capital. Mm -hmm. And it's the same story I saw in the four benefit space is they get lured into taking capital and doing a deal with the devil, so to speak. And before they know it, they're stuck in a game design that's that's not the one they're trying to actually replace. And it so a lot of my work now has been looking at how do you access different types of capital? And so how do you provide more philanthropic capital for some of these projects to, to, to have lift off to their next level? They might have some level of proof of concept, but they need that next level of, of capital. That's That's basically what I've been focusing on, particularly for Web3 projects that are focused on the future of coordination and um, happy to say that we've made great progress in that and um, using also different legal structures, uh, using donor advised funds, for example, like you can, you can use structures that give you some of the benefits of being a nonprofit without needing to be fully a nonprofit. You can, there's, there's a lot of creativity that's come in from our learning in building the four sector and being in this hybrid space between for-profit and non-profit that can get applied to these these web3 projects and so i think the challenge is um, them knowing about that and having the right mentorship and guidance and getting access to the right type of capital mm. yeah it's it's definitely one of my big concerns about web3 that we are funding a lot of the most promising projects through traditional vc model and, you know, I have a lot of friends who are VCs and I respect, you know, the people and the, um, the disciplines and the, the skills that venture capital has brought into funding risk and innovation in our global economy. I lived in Silicon Valley for, for over 10 years. And yet my experience there, you know, also led me to believe that when you fund these organizations in that way with the current approach, um, that exactly what we were talking about earlier, the, the incentives end up kind of overcoming the, the good intentions and oftentimes the for-profit um, driver um, leads to things like Facebook, you yeah. know, like, I mean, the people that, that built Facebook and the intentions behind it and so forth were, in my opinion, really um, noble in many ways. And yet look at all of the unintended consequences and the challenges that we currently face with that platform. Um, and so, yeah, like how do we not do that as a Web3 community and be overly idealistic about um, our intentions, but then still embed those same problematic incentive structures, especially when we have new tools? right like we have tokens we have totally. new forms of incentives <laughs> and so forth like th these are yeah, yeah. these are vehicles so yeah I i'd love to do, dive into that a bit further about you know you brought up donor advised funds and that's not something i'm hearing many people talk about can can you unpack that a bit more sure uh, what are donor advised funds and how do they potentially intersect with this field so donor advised funds um allow a donor uh somebody with capital to put money into essentially a nonprofit structure, get the highest possible tax write-off um, and wait to deploy that capital. And they can deploy that capital and through investments. Now, when they do that, uh, those in, that the return on those investments remain tax-free. 
So it's 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 an it was designed as an incentive vehicle to move more money into philanthropy, right? Recognizing that you can just rely on the government to distribute tax money, but individuals, um, ha- more individuals helping deploy that money is basically broadening the sense making and choice making, um, which has its advantages. And so it's a phenomenal. Um, not it's not nearly well known enough, although it's become the fastest growing charitable structure by a long shot in the last yeah. five years. Yeah, the charts just yeah, it's yeah. absolute S curve. And so, um, so when you're raising money for a project, you now have a way of raising money that would give an investor uh, a philanthropic container, so they get a tax receipt while still being able to invest in your company, right? Um, most people that are playing this investor role, they've met their sufficiency. They don't need more money to buy more houses, more cars. They're at a place where the excess is going to put into projects that have purpose. Mm -hmm. So the limitation of the donor advised fund is that that excess um, capital created from their investments stays in a nonprofit context. Now, there's a lot you can do (laughs) within -hmm. within that nonprofit context. Uh, And so... So that's that's I'm part of a fund that we've been setting up donor advised funds for for people, particularly focused on the future of coordination and Web three projects, and helping their funders and helping the projects take advantage of basically what you could say is hybrid capital or being hybrid structured. Mm-hmm. So you get the boast of for profit nonprofit, mm-hmm. and um, and there's a lot you can do with tokens. In in uh, we designed our our DAF structure so that it's it works fluidly with tokens. You can put tokens into the DAF. You can move tokens out of the DAF just like you can with regular capital. Mm-hmm. And so it's preparing it for this the the, the future. And um, and so that's what we explored in the for benefit space. You have to have incentive to shift capital. And with DAFs, you have incentive because you can offer the type of tax benefit. That we were trying to mandate through four benefit structures um, way back when. And so I love that. I think it's huge and it's obviously taking off for a reason. Yeah. So it has a real distinct advantage where, especially if you have a sudden um, increase in funds that, that you sold a business, for example, and you're like, well, I don't know exactly all the different nonprofits I want to give to in this particular moment. Okay. I can move that capital into a donor advised fund, whether it's Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Fidelity, RSF Social Finance, here in New Zealand, the Gift Trust. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different donor advised funds. And now I'm getting the tax incentive of either reducing my my taxable income, but I'm moving those funds into this vehicle where now I have uh, more flexibility of when I recommend donations into the philanthropic space with qualifying nonprofits. Um, I can do that. And so I'm essentially uh, assigned on the account to make those recommendations with the DAF provider and DAF being donor advised fund. And so um, that structure also enables the management of the endowment to be expressed through investments. And so right now, unfortunately, most of the capital inside donor advised funds is expressed through index funds in the stock market and bonds. Exactly. Right. Pretty vanilla, you know, run of the mill investment types that are just supporting the existing system as is. Um, But some donor advised funds specialize in really trying to bring your investment capital also into more purposeful investments. One that comes to mind is impact assets, Mm -hmm. um, which manages a few billion dollars of client funds and tries to help match uh, those client recommendations for the endowment management into portfolios that at the very least have things like negative ESG screening or you know targeted pinpointed uh, for purpose um, investments. Yeah. And in full disclosure, I work with almost all of those names th- yeah. that have been mentioned and have you know different client relationships um, in this space. And so, yeah, it, it seems like it's a good vehicle. I do see that donor advised funds risk um, kind of just being a giant you know tax haven for being able to move money out of the tax system, but still um, being able to kind of hoard the power that comes with all of that decision-making 
And so you can have billionaires just having all of their wealth stored in donor advised funds and then doing their different pet projects, whether it's in for-profit or nonprofit, and still accruing all of the social capital and other forms of power um, without necessarily, you know, the true intent of getting the money back ah, into. So, so now let's bring the Web3 space into this. So imagine that the donor advised fund was like a wallet and everybody, everybody's crypto wallet was a donor advised fund. So everybody participating in the success of this space was able to leverage this vehicle, right? And so now, yes, you still have some of the early funders, big funders having maybe more resource, but I think it's an interesting tool to support all those who are truly devoted to the long-term system change and the impact of their projects to be able to get the benefits the government has designed, you know, purposely for this to say, hey, if, if you're really committed to impact, be a, be a choice maker. Don't just rely on the government, be the choice maker of the tax money. We're going to give you this tool so you right. get to decide where those uh, where that 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 access money goes. Another key value that the Web three space brings as a tool set is is around transparency, right? Because right now a lot of the investments or donations being made from DAF funds it's fairly opaque, um, and so I feel like that the, this new frontier of DAFs meets Web three can also create new new levels of transparency. And where we put our money powers a system. You know, we know the banking system can leverage the money we have on deposit, and that creates the fragility in the model as well. But what are they using that money for? And so I feel like every every time we spend our money or deposit our money, we're making a vote. Mm. And so the the DAF fund that that I've been participating in is is a hundred percent committed to systemic change. So we're particularly careful on where that money is banked and. Um, create options to have the donors put that money into their own recommended investments, into their own types of social impact projects, rather than be limited to a common set of ESG kind of investments, what I, I would say is like often greenwashed. And so um, I don't want to oversell the DAF and then people go off to Fidelity. And I think that's participating more in the old system. In ours is invite only. You know, it's it's a boutique, so it's not like open to everybody that can just have a bank account. But if the projects are aligned, the investors are aligned, they're hundred percent committed to systemic change around the sustainable development goals. Boom, great. Let's create that tribe, that trust, that family. And um, but the transparency is so important, and so often we don't take the time to look. Well, where where's that money actually sitting? What's it being used for? Mm -hmm. And are these investments that they're recommending for me even really? part of the change. Right, because getting back to the, the early points about the incentives underneath, and you know, I can say my DAF is committed to systemic change or to environmental projects or whatever, um, but so often in our current incarnations of capitalism, the incentive to perpetually grow supersedes those missions and those originally stated purposes. Yeah. And so what I like about philanthropy is that the capital is so much more liberated. Um, you're not, you know, in this DAF example, um, needing to answer to quarterly statement, mark to market for LPs to show growth of the portfolio mm -hmm. and compete against other fund managers necessarily. You don't have interest payments back to a bank necessarily because you've already moved the capital into this new liberated, ring-fenced, nonprofit, un, you know, taxless kind of uh, context mm -hmm. um, where it can be deployed. And it makes it so much psychologically easier to see sub-market returns, right? Where maybe the DAF is only getting 4% per annum on its, you know, on its money, but that's okay because it's in devotion to the, the mission of the incentive that underpinned underneath to move it into philanthropy to begin with. Now, that all being said, you see a lot of endowments still caught in the trap of just trying to grow the endowment, mm -hmm. right? And you see silos of endowment managers on one side and the grant making on the other side, and they don't even necessarily always talk to one another. And, and these hybrid models are still fairly rare. Yeah. Uh, any comments on all of that? I think it's you're you're spot on. It's like we got to remember what the incentives are and that that actually drive the behavior. And in the financial world, 
the incentives are so driven to maximizing profit and we rely on finance this it's like we said well, what's the biggest challenge well it's funding so we, we, we double click on that and we go into the, like this whole landscape of venture capital and banking and we see the fragility of it and the madness of it and so yeah i really encourage as entrepreneurs like know where you're banking know what the incentives are of any funds you're working with and um and understand DAFs. i mean with tokens one thing you can do you could put your tokens in a DAF. they appreciate and you get a tax write-off for whatever that appreciation was because it's held within that nonprofit vehicle. So whenever you sell those tokens, that's a no-brainer. You know, mm -hmm. if you're truly committed to impact um, and and recognize that you, you're still stewarding that resource, right? Uh, you can still move that resource into projects that generate revenue. Mm -hmm. It's a no-brainer to use some of these vehicles so you keep more of the money and steward more of that capital towards the long-term impact that you really dedicated to right so as i understand it if i buy a token for five dollars and then you know put it into a DAF when it's at 10 i'm effectively writing off that appreciation and not being taxed on it so and this works at traditional equity structures as well which is why DAFs have been a popular choice for public company stock donations exactly obviously none of this is financial advice we are not tax exactly <laughs> we're speaking from one limited frame in our united states context do not take any of this too yeah. literal if you're listening, because we're just kind of talking more at the hypothetical. But it's clearly a high growth area. Um, I do think there's some shadow sides in the DAF industry and that they will probably start to have some reckoning soon as yeah. more people get into these nuances. Especially and, with the big banks. Yeah, especially with the big banks. T tell me a bit more about that. Well, 90% of DAFs are held within the big banks. So you just know, know that there's there's... There's that game, there's that version, and it's still great, still has a lot of benefits, but um, the challenge has been working with DAFs that are truly all the way through transparently committed to uh, what I believe is, a, is the full potential with it, which is, which is um, serving um, purpose-driven projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if people want to explore projects that are in and around this intersection of donor-advised funds and Web3 or crypto, I'm aware of endowment, like DAO endowment is doing some mm. interesting things. I, I know that change.org is kind of experimenting with a lot of things around crypto donations. Um, Daffy.org, D-A-F-F-Y, is doing interesting things around crypto. Are there other projects or places you would recommend? I mean, I, I think that's a really good place to start. Um, yeah, if anybody, we're not like publicly you know, promoting mm -hmm. what we're doing. But if somebody feels they have a project that is in the Web3 space that could really benefit from this, uh, they could they could shoot me an email, uh, andrew.h at gamechangers.co. Um, and I think those other projects you mentioned are, are fantastic places to start. Excellent. Great. Okay, so we've double-clicked on funding mm -hmm. as one of those key challenges. What else are the key challenges here in this transformation? Yeah, so to get back to how do we truly change the game, right? we got six game dynamics. What are the ones that are the, ch the biggest challenges? So I'd say funding for sure. Um, funding sets up if you're going to stay committed to the long-term objective. It often changes your incentive model, what you measure. So it's, it's an early big lever of all the other game dynamics. Um, the other biggest challenge, I would say, is in the area of development. How do you train people to actually play this type of game? Especially when we've come from generations of playing a game that's, that's based in competition and win-lose and us versus them. It's a zero-sum game. We're, we're conditioned for that. Our society reinforces it every single day. And so I think just first and foremost, taking the pause and recognizing that you have those patterns <laughs> mm. and that you're going to need to face them and it's going to be work and you will be so liberated when you get those patterns moved out of your awareness out of your body and can operate more synergistically more cooperatively the joy of contribution is so much greater uh, than than just getting right it's to give versus to get it's like we know the giving is 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 the getting it's like that's that is that is the greatest joy mm. and so so then the question comes well what is the way in which we 
nurture our capacity to be in coherence with other human beings. Um, and I like the analogy of, of a jazz band, right? So um, right now you could say we're, we're more like a marching band. Everybody's playing their specific notes mm -hmm. and it's all written, pre-written and it's very jagged, right? Not mm -hmm. fluid at all. There's a start and there's a finish. And we're being invited to erupt into spontaneous music. And the first part of that is to know what instrument you are, right? It's like, what's the sound that wants to play through you? Uh, to really know that, to what brings you alive? What's your contribution to the orchestra of life? Like the pine tree plays its role, right? The, the hawk plays its role. What are you in, in the, the, the dance of life? And, um, and then second, when the music comes through you, are you squeaky? Are you are you staticky? Are you you know? Are you noise? Are you are you signal? Are you just harmony? And what's in the way of that music coming through you being the essence of your heart, really, right? And often that is, uh, you could say, it's our different trauma patterns. And there's lots of great you know ways of looking at this. There's Enneagram. I love five personality patterns. It's a great book on this. And so to actually do the work to know. When you're in pattern, which is, as I say, when you're in noise, you're basically operating from fear, from resistance, from control, um, versus when you're when you're free, when you're liberated, when you're coming from abundance, just to bring what you have coming through you in contribution to the whole. Um, and that there's there's a lot there, right? Mm. Once you're anchored in your knowingness of 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 what's yours to give, you've you've got grounded in the signal. In, 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 in the sound that you're meant to play and you can play it in harmony, that I, f I feel is true sovereignty. That is what sovereignty means. It's being a free being that, and you know these masters, you see them throughout the world. It's like, they're, they're not trying to position themselves as something or, you know, they're just there in pure joy and contribution. Then how do you stay in that place as you work with other people? You know, that's the real work right there. It's like you can meditate, you can do all these personal practices, and then you go to work and you're like, oh, I'm so triggered by right. so and so, the mirrors all around you. Right. And so I feel we need a lot more group practice. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of different people working in this space. I've been a part of bringing people through these different processes to help teams learn how to be more like a jazz band mm -hmm. and um, be surprised by the music that comes out. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking about this phenomenon that I experience a lot here in New Zealand that people call the dawn chorus. And when dawn breaks, you know, you hear a few birds mm -hmm. start the choir and then you hear a few more and a few more and it, it turns into this incredible crescendo. I mean, the first time I heard it, I was in tears because, you know, we're blessed to live amongst nature and you just hear all of these different bird species singing Mm -hmm. And it's not marching band. It's not pre-scripted, mm -hmm. right? And, but it's this, this beautiful mm -hmm. choir of wow. all of the different contributions at, that, that come. And then it, it actually then settles down, right? It's like this, this um, maybe 10 minute uh, kind of experience. And so, yeah, I, I love mm -hmm. these metaphors and I love looking to nature to inspire how we can um, you know, redesign these systems and think about our, our ecological niche, our, our purpose and our place inside the wider web. Um, and it has been such a pleasure. Are there any other final thoughts or sure. uh, messages that you'd like to share? What moves us to do something meaningful, purposeful in the world is usually to um, respond to disharmony. We have a lot of disharmony in the world, right? And I think it's important to remember the only way to move from disharmony to harmony is to be in harmony first. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that can cause us not to be in harmony within ourselves. And that can be environmental, things that are physically in our body, toxins that cause us to be in distress. Um, that can be uh, trauma patterns that are passed on or, or things that we've experienced in this life, um, all sorts of different fears. And, and so, you know, life has given us an incredible context of all the disharmony to motivate us to come into harmony. And if our internal world is 
is is just reflecting um, out to the external world, right? It's a mirror, and it's 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 showing us the way. And if our uh, quality of of being informs our quality of doing, then who do we need to be in order to create a more harmonious world? And I feel that is the great invitation, and it's and it's an adventure, and we're all here uh, meeting in this moment to be on that adventure together. Mm. Thank you, Andrew Hewitt. Appreciate your time. Yeah, it's been a, been a pleasure. All right. What do you think of that conversation with Andrew? Please leave us a comment below. Like, share, subscribe. You can find more conversations like this one at maearth.com. This is season one of the Regeneration Will Be Funded. We'd love to engage with you and hear more of what you think. You can find me in the community Discord. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.